Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. Broadcasting you today from our top secret broadcasting compound up in the balcony behind the sanctuary at 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri. But we don't want anybody to know that, so please don't let that secret out, all right? Got a letter. You know, I get a lot of emails from people, and I appreciate that, and I'd love to read the emails. Uh, I admit I'm a little backed up today on emails, and uh, <clears throat> so I've got... I don't know, like a day and a half worth of emails to go through. and uh, But I appreciate all the letters everybody sends me. This one uh, was rather interesting. I got a letter. It's not like a letter to Santa or anything like that. Uh, but it's a letter from Lord Maitreya. You know who that guy is. Benjamin Cream is this new age leader. He's been going around telling everybody. He's the guy that put these big full page ads in newspapers all around the country in 1982 saying, you know, the Christ is coming. Uh, the, you know, this world leader is going to come and he's ready to come now. Any day now he's going to come out and he's going to show himself to the world. Well, he never showed up. So anyway... This guy named Matreya, I don't know who he is, I, I, I don't really get much into him, because uh, I really don't think that he's the beast, but anyway, uh, Benjamin Cream thinks he is, and he's got his own, web. the beast has his own website, by the way. Anyway, this is a letter from uh, Lord Matreya answering the question, am I the Antichrist? Message from Matreya. Recently on a radio show, my channel, Margaret, was asked if I, Maitreya, am the Antichrist. Margaret very bravely defended this statement. However, I am telling all and sundry, yes, I am the Antichrist. Why is this? I say this because I teach that, that much in Christian belief has been changed, altered, twisted even, beyond the words it once was. Well, I'll tell you what, I agree with that 100%. The Christian teaching states that one should help another. Do all one can to assist a soul who is in need. But what if you're stopping that soul from learning important lessons to assist its growth? What if by helping that soul you bring it back for another incarnation? That your intervention or interference will stop that soul from finishing its incarnation round and creates further karma. My teaching goes against the teaching of Christianity. But what is the teaching of Christianity? This teaching is nothing like it was in the beginning. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to read any more of this. This is this. I don't even know if this is a hoax or not. Uh, I'm assuming that it's quasi-legitimate. In other words, there probably is some lady out there named Margaret who thinks she channels the Antichrist. And uh, but the truth of it is, the gospel that you and I teach, the gospel that you and I believe in. It's the same gospel that was from the beginning of time, even now. It's the gospel of our faith. It is the truth that, you know, people make, this is what gets me, people make Christianity out to be everything that they think that it ought to be. They say Christianity is about helping people. Christianity is about uh, being kind to one another. Christianity, is, you know, all of those things are embedded in Christianity, but the bottom line of Christianity is that man is lost in a lost condition because of his own sinfulness. And the devils cannot save you. You cannot save yourself. Only Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross can save you from the wrath of God that is coming upon your soul. That is the true message. And I'll say this, that's the true message of Christmas. That's the true message of salvation and Christianity. Don't let anybody make it out into anything less than what it's really all about. Islamic mosque built at 9-11 ground zero. My eyes almost shot out of my head when I saw this. New Islamic mosque will open its doors just steps from ground zero where Muslim terrorists murdered 2,751 people in the name of Allah September 11, 2001, its leading imam who conducts sensitivity training sessions for the FBI has reportedly blamed Christians for starting mass attacks on civilians. This is just ignorant to me. The five-story building at Park Place, just two blocks north of the former World Trade Center site, was the site of a Burlington coat factory, but a plane's landing gear assembly crashed to the roof on the day, on the day 19 Muslim terrorists hijacked the airliners and flew them into the Twin Towers in 2001. Now Muslim worshipers currently occupy the building and they plan to turn it into a major Islamic cultural center. 
The men and women stand up, raise their hands on either side of their head, murmur, Allah Akbar, bow and kneel again, reports Spiegel online. The article later goes on to say, just down the street, the Museum of Jewish Heritage honors victims of the Holocaust in St. Peter's Church, New York's oldest Catholic house of worship, is located around the corner. Ralph has announced his plans to turn the building into a complete Islamic cultural center with a mosque, a museum, merchandising op options, and there you go, and room for seminars to reconcile religions, to counterattack the backlash against Muslims in general, Spiegel reports. The project may cost as much as $150 million. I guess this, um, this thing to reconcile religions, I guess is, you know, the Muslims' way of saying, you know, next time we crash a building, we want everybody involved in it. I mean, next time we kill innocent men and women and children and burn their bodies alive and cut their heads off, well, we just want to embrace everybody in that effort. Leading the charge in this is our own President of the United States, Barack Mohammed Mustafa Hussein Obama. Here he is at a mosque prayer time, taking his shoes off before entering a mosque. This is, this is the President of the United States. Now, if I remember right, I think George Bush did the same thing too during his presidency. I didn't like it when Bush did it. Did it. I don't like it now that Moh Mohammed, Barack Mohammed Mustafa Hussein Obama is doing the same thing. We have lost, we have talked about losing Christianity. We've lost this country. We've lost the meaning behind what our country stood for our founding fathers and I'm going to deal with this when I go to Lexington next month uh, doing the seminar out there at Calvary Baptist Church get the results from uh, Cutting, Edge Re uh, Cutting Edge Ministries website or you can contact uh, our ministry and we'll give you the uh, where we're going to be and when we're going to be and how long we're going to be and things like that but anyway uh, this just absolutely drives me insane I'm going to be talking about some of the foundation principles of our country you know everybody says you know America was always intended to be a Freemasonic state no it wasn't no it wasn't there were some good godly men who knew that God had put them in this land so that they could worship him as they saw fit the way the Bible directed them but here again it's been turned to every, into everything else the same way with the church uh, the church was founded upon the, the founding principles of the scriptures and yet now all these preachers are transforming the church into something else Christmas was supposed to be a day is supposed to be a day where we can celebrate the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ but it's been turned into everything else other than what it's supposed to be this is the transformation which we live in you know I'm gonna do something right now my tie is crooked I'm just gonna fix my tie is that there how's that look Does that look better all right very good See, I can kind of see myself during all this. Anyway, uh, here's another story that goes along with this from a guy by the name of Todd Starnes. It says, second graders sing about Allah. A battle over religion is brewing in central Indiana after a public school wanted second graders to sing a song declaring Allah is God. The phrase was removed just before the performance after a national conservative group launched a protest. Good for them launching a protest. Uh, the principal of Lantern Road Elementary School in Fishers, Indiana, said that they were trying to teach inclusiveness through their holiday production. It included references to Christmas, Hanukkah, Ramadan, Las Posadas, and I don't know what Las Posadas is, and Kwanzaa. However, no other deity other than Allah was referenced in the show. Yeah, I understand the fact that we have to live next door to people that don't agree with us and don't believe like us and don't participate in what we participate in. But the Bible f strictly forbids us from naming the name of another God or letting the name of another God come out of our lips. This is what people don't get. They say, oh, you've got to be inclusive. You've got to be tolerant of everybody. Okay, I tolerate everybody else's religion in the fact that I don't go bomb their buildings. But the idea is tolerating them and participating with them, they're two different things. Uh, parents, watch for your kids. I know a lot of you parents, you might homeschool, but some of you don't. You send your kids to public school, and I say pray for them when they get on that bus. Pray for them throughout the day, that God will give them a layer of protection around them. And I will tell you this, that if you hear th stuff like this going on at your school, stand up to them. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of the school board. Don't be afraid of that principal, that superintendent. You stand up. You have a voice that can be heard. 
Blow the trumpet in your neighborhood for crying out loud. It's time that this nonsense that we are just, we're just letting everybody just run over us and run over our country. This has got to stop. And I say watch under prayer and, and, and have a civil attitude about it. But I'm telling you to watch what's going on. Uh, somebody sent me this. The Metropolitan Community Church has a transgender day of remembrance. The queer world is still under attack in many reaches of this world. Though advances are made every day for the inclusion and acceptance of homosexual people, yet our gender variant and transgender siblings continue to suffer the pain of abuse and murder, even of our most progressive communities. The thing that I wanted to point out to you in this, the Transgender Day of Remembrance, uh, the Metropolitan Community Church Transgender Day of Remembrance, take a look at the logo that they're using. I'm telling you that there is a big thing here going on in the world uh, that is linking the homosexual, the radical homosexual movement and uh, this triple helix thing. And, we're, and here again, I, I, you know, I'm going to keep doing this until I run out. But you guys are the one feeding me all this. You're sending me all these logos and symbols. I uh, made a mistake and went with my, my, well, I won't say it's a mistake. My wife asked me, will you take me to Walmart tonight? I got some Christmas shopping I want to do. So I took her over there, and I'm just looking at name brands and logos. I was talking to one of our watchers, Bill, from uh, Omaha, Nebraska today. He came by for a visit. And uh, I said, Bill, it looks like to me that all these logos are changing. And uh, so we're going to bring you some more of those. But just take a look again at that transgender thing, the triple helix. I'm telling you, there's something about this. And I think if I remember reading from one of the New Age sources that I have, is that homosexuality is celebrated and transgenderism is celebrated because, here again, it represents the fusion of things that are opposite and them fusing together. And in their mindset, there's nothing more that epitomizes that more than someone who changes their gender or homosexual and or lesbian couples because it combines both the elements of male and female together in one package. You know, that's just sick to even talk about. But anyway, that's kind of where we live in today. Uh, the Copenhagen deal is still going on. Uh, they're talking about, uh, you know, how, how the planet is warming up. And it's just, boy, it's just getting hotter and hotter every day. And oh, by the way, they had a tremendous blizzard snowstorm over there. They're having one in New York this week. Uh, many places across the East Coast are digging out, in some cases, two feet worth of snow. One of the things that I didn't educate myself about was the idea that I didn't know that as the climate grows warmer, so does the freezing point of water. Apparently, it's warm, and it's getting warmer every day, but water must freeze at a higher temperature because, you know, we shouldn't have that much snow. We shouldn't have that much ice. We should not have the kind of winters that we've been having, or even the kind of summers that we've been having for years. But I've been telling you on this broadcast, and, and I'm not someone going around saying, well, I was right, I was right about this, but I've been telling you on this broadcast, there's something I figured out about this thing, that it's about... The spirit of this world, Gaia, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And she can't stand all the pesky human beings walking on top of her and having dominion. She cannot handle the fact that God gave man dominion over her. She's Jezebel. She can't handle that. So she has a solution to this. Let's get rid of all the pesky human beings. This is from World Net Daily. Uh, want to reduce carbon emissions and curb global warming? Global warming believers say you should stop having babies. China has declared that controlling population growth is the final solution to climate change. This pronouncement is officially linked to zeal for population control with climate hysteria surfacing an issue uh, that has been quietly at the heart of the Malthusian writing since Obama. Science star John Holdren began writing college textbooks on echo science with Paul Ehrlich of population bomb infamy. infamy. Uh, Jerome Corsi's red alert illustrated the point by arguing the following reductio ad absurdum. Since people exhale carbon dioxide and since people also use carbon fuels, more people create more carbon dioxide. Since more carbon dioxide creates global warming, the final solution, therefore, is to eliminate people. And so the solution is to have fewer babies to save the planet, regardless of what extreme measures have to be taken, including government forced sterilization and compulsory government ordered abortion. You think that that's all tongue in cheek, but the truth is, and as, as I speak right now, uh, it's come out that, that uh, President Barack Mustafa Hussein Obama 
has, um, I don't, maybe I shouldn't call him that, but anyway, has, has paid off senators by promising them big things for their districts and things like that in order to get them to vote on health care. Now, the fight, even if the Senate votes on it, and they will, and it'll probably pass, uh, there's too much money at stake. You know, this tie is really bothering me. No, that's, that's not good. Here, all right. Anyway, uh, what's at stake here? There's too much money, too much power at stake here for this to not pass. It'll probably pass. And while some of these congressmen and senators are coming out saying, well, we won't support abortion in here, and we won't support uh, Medicare for illegal aliens, and we won't support that, the truth of it is now that once the Senate votes on it, the House and the Senate have to get together, work on this compromise bill, and I guarantee you some of that stuff's going to fly back in there. I guarantee you it is. Obama promised a revolution in this country. I think he's about to get one, whether he wants one or not. But in probably, more than likely, embedded in this health care legislation is going to be some sort of population reduction plan through, through government paid for abortions. This is your tax money going to kill babies. What a shame. What a shame we live in the kind of country where people who are adamantly, diametrically, vehemently opposed to killing babies, their money is going to go toward killing babies. What a shame. If there was ever a time we need to be aware of what's going on in our country, that time is now. Change is a coming. There is revolution in the air. The transformation of America is well on its way. Talked to a pastor several years ago. He has since uh, he was killed in a car wreck and gone on to be with the Lord. I asked him what he thought about um, the Harry Potter books. This, you know, kind of when they were new. And he said, "Mike, let me tell you something." He said he was talking to a now get this. He was talking to a a missionary to Denver, Colorado. And this missionary to Denver, Colorado said, "I've read the Harry Potter books. There's nothing to it. I encourage everybody to read it. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. People are just making some big thing out of it." And I said, I said, what did you think? And he said, Mike, he said, I read that book from cover to cover. And when I got done, I closed the book. And I wanted to go be a wizard. We've been warning people. have been warning people about Harry Potter and the whole thing about this uh, wizardry and teaching these kids. And they said, well, you know, the kids are reading books now. They're reading. Well, what's wrong with them reading this one? Uh, but anyway, the idea was that they would be uh, influenced, in, infiltrated somehow, with casting spells and witchcraft and things like that. And everybody said, that's not going to happen. You right-wing conspiracy people, you guys are crazy. There's something wrong with you. So somebody sent me this. Uh, the iPods and the iPhones, you know, these things don't just play music. and They don't just make phone calls. They run programs. They're little handheld uh, computers. And see, I like that because I like, I like computers. And I like, you know, mine's a Samsung Jack or something like that. And I can run a few programs on here, but not like the iPods. I mean, those are cool. Well, apparently, you can get a Harry Potter's Spells program for your iPod or your iPhone. It says, uh, what kind of things can you do with Harry Potter? Spells? You start by learning how to cast all your spells. Each spell is a rep represented by a specific gesture with your iPhone or iPod Touch. There are 14 spells in the game, which is quite a lot to remember. One of the main features of the app is the ability to duel other people. You can play it single player as well as uh, AI or artificial uh, intelligence opponents. Harry Potter teaching your kids to cast spells. <gasps> That'll never happen. Well, it's happening right now. And, I, and it, we look at a situation now... Uh, where our young people are being infiltrated with witchcraft, pornography. They are taught to love devils and devilish things by the Twilight series. Blood-sucking vampires used to be, oh no, a vampire! And now our teenage girls are just falling in love with them. You can clearly see that we're being set up in this country. We're being set up, our, especially our children. See, you old guys... You're not going to go out and buy an iPhone so you can get the Harry Potter spell casting software. So they don't care that you just don't participate and they're just going to wait till you die off. But this generation coming up, it scares me. 
These kids, although having never learned one Bible verse in their life, probably never been to a church service in their whole life, they are being taught a New Age meditative practices. They're being taught rock and roll. They're being taught pornography. They're being taught spell casting. They're being taught everything in the world except what they need for eternal life. It's this generation coming up that will and is already revolutionizing and changing the world. Handing the kingdom, the dominion that man has over the earth, to the Antichrist. And I'm afraid that we're closer than we think. Uh, let's see here. Take a look at this one. Verichip's merger with credit monitoring firm worries privacy activists. Remember Verichip, the Florida company that once dreamed of injecting its human implantable RFID chips in everyone from immigrant guest workers to prison inmates? We haven't heard much from the company since a dipping stock price nearly got it uh, delisted from the NASDAQ in March, but it's still live, and in November it pulled off a seemingly incongruous acquisition. Now called Positive ID, the new company is a merger between Verichip and Steel Vault, the people behind NationalCreditReport.com. With a human implantable microchip maker now running a credit scoring and identity theft protection website, privacy activists are worried again. Their attraction to investors is the potential for synergies. That word synergy is real important. Synergy is two things that need each other to survive. Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom. They synergize with one another. They are joining and fusing together. Get this. It's like, it's like another brick in the wall of bringing us toward the level of the mark of the beast. The idea that, you know what? I, you know, this is, I, boy, I hate to do this. I know this is not like live and I could edit it out, but I'm just going to undo my tie. How's that look? How's that look for you? All right. Uh, but anyway, here's what they're going to do. Remember the verse, Revelation chapter 13. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, so that no man, here we go, could buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so here's the deal. Here's what's going on. We now see another brick in the wall, another link in the chain that connects... Uh, this microchip technology, the mark of the beast, being able to buy. You see, if you don't have any credit, you can't buy anything. And the way the, the, the economies of the world are going now toward a, a common currency or a single currency, eliminating these national currencies and also bringing us to a paperless cash system, you're looking at a situation where if they don't want you to buy or sell, you're not going to buy and sell. And that's all there is to it. This is where we stand on that right now. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? Uh, Bill was asking me how I pick some of these things out. Oh, they just have to look good, and then I'll pick them out. Uh, here's one. The guy, that, uh, the guy down in Florida that takes pictures of stuff, and remember last week he showed us his toes. Uh, this week he's showing us his, his fingers. Uh, he, he took a picture of this, and I'd seen this before, but I'd never seen it in this version. Spiriva. Now the word Spiriva has to do with uh, spirit. Spirit. And you notice the logo there. The, uh, it's almost like, a, like an eye in the capstone. The, the um, although I can't think, the whirlpool or whatever that symbol is there. You, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Maybe I should put my tie back on right. Uh, anyway, uh, that is a symbol. That's a Fibonacci swirl. That's what it was, a Fibonacci swirl. That's a symbol for DNA. That's a symbol also for the lost word of Freemasonry. It's almost like an eye uh, inside, of a, inside of a pyramid. You sort of get the idea here. Start looking at pharmaceutical companies and their logos and the symbols behind them. You're going to start seeing things, things. If you begin to understand the language of symbols, you'll understand this stuff as you see it. Here's something else that somebody, I appreciate what you guys send me. Sometimes it just overwhelms me. I, I can't have it all. I can't put it all out here on the broadcast uh, or I'd be doing like five days a week of this stuff. Uh, but because it's out there, it's out there in droves. But this one caught my attention. Uh, the AAAS plus U equals three strand DNA. I mean, take a look at it. 
Uh, let's see, what is this? We've been asked to relay the broad scientific community the following opportunity to advise U.S. government policymaking uh, deliberations. This is some sort of uh, American Academy of Sciences or something like that. Uh, basically, science is one of those things that is revered in Freemasonry as being the ultimate of man's quest for knowledge, okay? Uh, science is power. You'll see that emblem there. Notice the, the relationship between it and the triple helix. Here's another one here that uh, was sent me. I've seen these things around. I think I have. I've seen something like it. These little three-wheeled cars, the three-wheeled motor scooters. This is the Peugeot Hybrid 3 Evolution three-wheel scooter. I mean, who doesn't get that? I mean, if you've seen you know, any of the stuff that we put out, you understand. Why is it, why is it that all of a sudden, Everybody's using this number three. Everybody's talking about hybrids. Everybody's talking about evolution, revolution, which is re-evolution. Why is it that all of a sudden all this stuff is happening all at once? That's because Marilyn Ferguson writes, and let's see, here it is, right here. Marilyn Ferguson writes in the Aquarian Conspiracy, she talks about that there is a conspiracy. There is a conspiracy amongst marketers, governments, factories, uh, legislators, educators, ministers. She talks about this conspiracy in a positive light. She said, we're going to change the world. We're going to bring everybody into community. And it's about the evolution of mankind. She writes this book in 1980. And now we can, I mean, this is like this stuff is kicking into high gear. We can see this stuff. All of a sudden, marketing, marketing products, logos, slogans, and it's like everybody is this spirit is collecting everybody together and say, here, do this, do this. I call it inspiration because that's exactly what it is. So we see it here, the Spariva thing we saw a while ago. Here's another one, the Center for Creative Leadership. This is one of those areas that the New Age movement moved into a long time ago. Uh, the New Age movement used to be, you know, it used to be these hippies and these weirdos from California back in the 60s and early 70s that had all these crystals everywhere and their house smelled like incense. Well, they've mainstream. You know, they had these retreats, you know, for these new agents to come in and get all this weird stuff due to them. But then they decided to mainstream. Instead of, instead of weird people coming to them, they go to the people and make them weird. They go to the corporations, the businesses. The Center for Creative Leadership is one of these new age things that will come into your company and train your leaders and train your people in the new techniques. I don't know what all techniques they're using, but it's like they're handing over this new spirit uh, that is driving the economics of this world. Notice their logo is the triple helix. Here's another one. One world, one vision, one voice. Notice three things here. This is a company called Fusion. Fusion offers a comprehensive portfolio of leading edge IP based voice and data services. It's about technology. It's about getting everybody. In fact, it's about, and I think this, I think that since Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, I think the devil has been working with his spirits through mankind to get them back to finishing the job that they started in Genesis 11. Now one of the things that God did was he confused the languages of mankind during that time. So you hear a lot from, from communications company, you know, one world, one vision, one voice. That's what it's about. It's about um, bringing back what was started in Genesis 11 before God confused the voices and the languages of mankind. And here we go. Now we're moving into the church stuff. Fusion Church. Where church is going. Take a look at it. Um, the Advent Conspiracy. Look at the bottom there. They have what's called Life Transformation Groups. Notice their logo. I mean, why couldn't they use like a little teddy bear here? Why couldn't they draw a picture of, of a church? They have to use these logos because that's the spirit that's driving them. It has to do, and, and I think about this a lot, you know, why, why is it that these images and these symbols are so important? Remember the Apostle Paul told us to cast down imaginations. We only lust for what we see. We can only imagine. We only build imaginations based upon what we see. 
We have fantasies that we play out on our minds, and they are partly based upon what we see, and then we kind of meld them together with something that's not real. And the Apostle Paul tells us as Christians to cast down imaginations, because imaginations have everything to do with images. Images that, instead of worshiping the real God that we can't see, we build images of a God so that we can see. I want you to think right now, before we end this broadcast, I want you to think now about the false prophet and one of the things that he does in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. I want you to think about that now. I promised in our pure Bible study the other day that I was going to show you something that just, this made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. When I show, I'm going to end the broadcast with this. When I show this to you, you're going to understand that we are, we're, I hate to even say that we're close. But it's like the roller coaster is going over the top of the hill. You know, the guys on the back side of the roller coaster, when the guys on the front side go over, they're not going all that fast. But we know we're headed downhill. And we're just waiting for the guys at the back of the roller coaster to hit the top. And as they start coming down, we start going down really, really, really fast. And I think the front part of the roller coaster is over the top. And I think we're starting to speed up. Let's see where it goes. Uh, here's, this life, here's another close-up view of this Life Transformation Groups uh, from Fusion Church. You know something that just dawned on me? I'm looking at the, the logo itself for Fusion Church. This looks an awful lot like, and I don't have an example up here, but this just dawned on me. Look at uh, uh, Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol inside of there, and you can find this. You can find this on the internet. Just type in Masonic ciphers. Masons have a, a way of ciphering things where they have these squares that are some, are some are complete and some are partial, and they have these little dots in them. That just dawned on me. That's exactly what that looks like. Uh, here's the Revolution Church. Notice their logo has three circles, and notice their name, the word revolution, has the number three in it. You know? I don't know. I don't have to, I don't have to come up with this stuff. The, the devil's doing it already. Um, you know what? I, am gonna, I want to show you this because this, this just uh, blew me away. Their sermon series from Revolution Church. Their sermon series says, Yes, oh God, yes. Christian pleasure in a world of whatever. It says, Sex is dirty. Chocolate is bad for you. Alcohol is Satan's elixir. Dancing is fornication with clothes on. Idle hands are the devil's playground. If it's fun, it's probably evil. But wait. Didn't God create sex and chocolate? Didn't Jesus turn water into wine? Didn't King David dance? And didn't God rest idly on day seven? So what has Christianity done to the pleasure of God? At Revolution, we believe God's answer to human pleasure is an always no, but yes. Join us for a series of conversations about sex and chocolate, desire and delight, joy and pleasure. And I preached this morning on godly roles for women. I preached last Sunday morning on marriage is to be a stable environment that's separated from the world. And I preached the Sunday before that about how marriage ought to be pure. I don't talk in church on this broadcast or to other people about the relationship that my wife and I share with one another. That's our business. These things, they, they are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. We're losing. We're losing. And you know, I hate to keep saying we're losing because ultimately we're the ones that are going to win in this thing as long as we stand on this old book and don't let the devil take it away from us. Here's a church called New Song. You know, and I got this one too. I get it. Remember the description of, of Lucifer in Ezekiel chapter 28. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Lucifer knows music. He's good at it. And when you start hearing these people talking about new song, new song, this new music, where did it come from? Here at Bethel Church, we don't sing the new music. We sing the old music. It's still good. The old rugged cross is what we'll sing about here. Anyway, their series called Evolve. Notice the, the, the sort of have a three strand DNA here with the, uh, with the thing of Evolve. Third culture community. That number three is so prominent. 
Uh, here it is right here, Fusion, uh, Fusion Ministries of New Song Church. They have what's called Holistic Adolescent Ministry. Holistic, I mean, that's like right out of here. It's like the people uh, who started this stuff, which you know probably wasn't this church. It's probably some publishing company way up here. They were going, let's see, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We could use that here in our Sunday school literature. That's what we'll do. Uh, when instead they should have consulted the Bible. There's a new show coming out. Uh, I, I kind of watched some of, the, of, of this uh, going on for years called Battlestar Galactica. What got my interest was uh, the fusion of uh, alien and human together. Uh, the, the leader of this group was a redheaded woman by the name of Rosalind, which is Roseline, so that kind of got my interest. I doubt seriously that I'll spend a lot of time, if any, watching this new show that's based upon the Battlestar Galactica series called Caprica. But uh, somebody sent me this and said, hey, Pastor Mike, take a look at the, uh, the show hasn't come out yet, but already, and let me, read the, let me read the logo here. It says, the future of humanity begins with a choice. Here's a beautiful woman holding an apple with a bite out of it. You get it, right? The future of humanity begins with a choice. And I'm telling you that that is, that is true. But mankind is making a choice right now against Jesus Christ and not for him. It's the same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden. And that which was is that which shall be. There's no new thing under the sun. Global Revolution Church, Encounter God. I want to kind of clue you in on a new, it's not really new to me. Uh, I talked about this logo in uh, some of our previous videos. I didn't really know what it meant until uh, here just recently, but it, it's sort of this, this person, uh, you'll see them uh, stretched out, their arms stretched out toward heaven. Sometimes their legs are spread apart a little bit. And really what that is, and here we are, we're dealing with the revolution again, evolution, revolution, turning things over, changing things, transformation. Really what this logo is all about is this. The skull and the crossbones, the X chromosome. The skull represents the Antichrist, uh, Golgotha, uh, the place of the skull. The skull represents the Antichrist fused into the X chromosomes or the DNA of mankind. Here's another church called Destiny Christian Center. There's one of these around here in this area too. Destiny Church. Come and experience your destiny. Really what's behind that is the teaching that you are you 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 have such great potential while you can be elevated to a higher level that's what they're teaching with all this destiny nonsense and they make it sound like that it's a gospel they may oh that's the gospel I'm telling you, that is so far removed from the gospel. But notice their logo under What's New. Here you again have another triple helix thing. Uh, here's a group called DNA Coaching. Uh, this is one of those things. You know, you see in these churches now these leadership seminars and, and these little leadership things where they you know, we need to find out what your spiritual gifts are. And so they do all this, this survey. Well, actually, it's called the Church Transformation Survey they just happen to use the DNA as their logo and everything, I'm telling you, everything is about DNA right now. And we know why. We know because Daniel 2 says they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And so we understand why these things are taking place. We're also starting to see that right now God, it just seemed like, is calling his people out. And I tell you, there's no better time to come out than right now. I'd say come out now before, you know, big mushroom clouds start going up everywhere. All right, here we go. Somebody sent me this, and I, and I don't think that they, the person who sent me this, I don't think that they got what this was about. I mean, I don't know. There wasn't a whole lot in their email, so I, I don't really know for sure. But I will tell you that when I saw this, and I, Jesse DePlan is one of those guys that just... Uh, he just gets on my nerves. I mean, I can't stand to watch this guy. Uh, I, I think everything to him is a big joke, is what I think. Hey, he's from New Orleans. He's from New Orleans, Louisiana. And, uh, but anyway, he's one of the false prophets of the last days. I want, you to, I want you to watch this, and I want you to think now what I told you to think about a while ago. Think about what the job of the false prophet is. What he what he causes he causes people to do two things. The second thing is that he causes people uh, to receive a mark on the right hand or forehead. That's his job. But before that, I want you to think about what he did. 
Um, just, and we'll read it from the scriptures. But I want you to see this. Jesse Duplantis is, and this is all set up. These doctrines, and I've watched some of these clowns on television. They will spend 30 minutes, or however long their sermon is, setting you up to teach you a false doctrine to the end. And they, they take scripture and they twist it so skillfully. And it's all a setup. They get you to agree with it all along while they're teaching it. And then when they get to the end and the false doctrine, bam, you've agreed all this time. Now you're sucked in. And so he's teaching a setup doctrine. And like I said, the doodads just came out of me. Get this image. Um, here I am talking about images. But I want to set this up for you. The scenery is the Garden of Eden before the fall of man. The word faith movement teaches that, that Adam was, was a god. He was a little god in the Garden of Eden. He, was, he had all the god powers. He had the, he had the faith force with him. He could say things and it would just create. I mean, Adam you know, created his own world. I mean, blah, blah, blah. So I want you to understand what's behind that. They believe that he, they teach that Adam had faith-filled words coming out of his mouth. So imagine what, what's being taught here as Jesse Taplantis tells everybody that when God created the animals, he didn't know what they were, and they had no life in them. They were, watch this, they were mannequins, they were statues. And I want you to listen very carefully to what Jesse Duplantis is teaching, and I will show it to you right from the Bible. Listen. Are you ready for this? But God didn't quit forming stuff out the dust. He created all kinds of animals, but he didn't know what they was. What is that? I have no idea what that is. Artists do that all the time. What am I trying? What's coming out of me? I can tell y'all don't believe me. Look at y'all going. You, you want me to prove it? How many of y'all want me to prove it to you? God made animals and didn't have that foggiest idea what they were. You want me to prove it to you? Tell me the book of Genesis chapter 2. I'll show you something. You think I'm joking? I'll show you something right now. Oh, Lord, let me finish this tonight. If you get ready, if you finish before I do, you can go home. Let, <laughs> let me finish this real quick. Genesis chapter 2. God made a horse and didn't have that far as I did what a horse was. Made a horse out the dirt, standing there like a mannequin. Look at me like this. Had no idea what it was. He just sculptured it. You don't believe me? I'll read prove it to you. Genesis chapter 2 verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them. Look at me. Look at me. He didn't walk them. He didn't fly them. He brought them. Watch me. Pick it up. Bring it over there. He brought them. Watch this. Unto Adam to see what he would call them. He didn't know what it was. He just made something. He said, what do you think that is, Adam? Adam's a speaking spirit. He said, that's a horse. <laughs> hey, Adam. Do you know that they were not alive when he brought them? He didn't walk them. He brought them. They were just like Adam was. Adam was creating the image of God. He was a speaking spirit like God is. Let me show you. Let me just show you. If you don't believe me, watch this. This will bless you. Watch it. And, and out of the ground, verse 19, Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every what? Living. Living. They weren't alive. They were just like him, formed out of the dust of the ground. And God looked at Adam and said, speak, spirit, what you're going to call that? That's a horse. <laughs> he brought them. He didn't walk them. He didn't fly them. He brought them. He picked them up and brought them. And he named 500,000 species. And life came into him. And he gave you creative ability. And he says, produce life. Look at your Bible. And what he called them every living. They were just like Adam. Mannequins formed. God didn't know what they were. Eagle. Fly like an eagle. Mm -hmm. A giraffe. Ooh. What's that, Lord? Looks like you just put parts on that one. That's a wildebeest. That's the leftovers. 
that animal look like he is a species of all kinds. Short, long nose, short ears, funny looking tail, weird looking body. See, people thought that the animals came in the ark two by two. Heard that? That's not true. The unclean animals came two by two. God's an environmentalist. He's not even going to kill the unclean ones. The clean animals came in by sevens. You never hear that part, do you? Why? Because the devil wants you to manifest on the unclean. Go read your Bible. You'll find out that the clean animals came in by sevens. The unclean came in by two. Then they were not even like When he spoke, speak spirit. Species life because he had life in him, just like God. he said, Adam, do what I do. That's why I give you dominion. That's why we're the only species on the earth that can destroy the planet. Can't you see that? Because we're speaking spirits. He says, God didn't know what a horse was. Man. Oh, by the way, somebody. <laughs> Somebody asked me in church this morning. I'm recording this Sunday afternoon. Somebody asked me in church this morning, uh, Pastor Mike, what do you think Oral Roberts is right now? You know, Oral Roberts died. I, I go back, you know, judge no man before the time, but I go back to a statement a good pastor friend of mine said concerning wolves in sheep's clothing. He said, wolves in sheep's clothing are not sheep. Something to remember. But anyway, God's such an idiot that he creates this mannequin or this statue of a horse and doesn't know what it was. And he, the thing that got me was he was attempting to prove this by Scripture. The Scripture never said anything about that. The pitiful part of it is, is that here is Jesse Duplantis spewing out this vomit on the tables, like in Isaiah 28. The only thing worse than a pastor spewing out this vomit on the tables there's all the church people there are going, oh, 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 that's good, licking it up. And that's exactly what's going on. But he says, God didn't know what a horse was. He made this mannequin, a statue, a set up doctrine. He brought it to Adam. And as Adam called its name, then it had life. Do you get it now? This is a set up doctrine. He says, uh, he gave you the creative ability and says, produce life. That's what he said. I'm going to read Revelation 13. This, wow. Look at this. Um, concerning the false prophet, Revelation 13, 12, when he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth, men, uh, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, like a mannequin of a horse, which had the wound by a sword and did live, and had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, them as, cause that as many should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The false prophet in the last days has the power. He causes everybody to build an image to the beast, and then he has the power to make the image, the statue, come to life. That's exactly what Duplantis was teaching these people. And they're going, oh, amen, oh, praise God, oh, that's, oh, that's it. The apotheosis is at hand, my friend. The transformation, the revolution, the evolution, the new paradigm, the community, the shape-shifting, these are all coming to pass right in front of our very eyes. I think that we're, we're going to celebrate a year of having this broadcast on, and I, I, don't, I don't know that in a year that I've ever done this, but I, I just feel led to right now. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you saved? I'm not asking you if you're on the right wing of, of all the politics or the right wing of all the conspiracy theories. I'm going to ask you today, are you saved? Are you born again? And don't just say, well, you know, I'm born, I believe in God, but I just don't go to church because they're corrupt. Excuses are over with. Are you saved? Do you have the absolute assurance right now that if you died today, 
you would go to heaven. Are your sins forgiven? Does, your, does it wreck your conscience when you violate the laws of God? Does it make you shiver in your, in your boots when you, uh, when you sin against God? Is the guilt and the, and the uh, power of the Holy Ghost bearing down on your life and you can't stand your sin anymore? I'm asking you today, are you saved? Because if you're not, you can believe all the conspiracy theories in the world and be on the right wing and you can listen to Alex Jones every day. And I'm telling you, if you're not saved, you're going to go stand in line and get a mark on your right hand or forehead. Either that or they'll cut your head off and you'll burn in hell for all of eternity if you're not saved. I'm telling you, get saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because God's going to... God's. I use this on, the, on my little desk here. I got a line here. God's drawing a line right now. And just because you have all the conspiracy theory knowledge in the world, that does not make you saved. Are you born again? Are your sins forgiven? When I get done with this broadcast, I think you ought to think about what I ask you. Get your Bible out. Read John chapter 3. Are you born again? Do you know for a fact that you have eternal life? Read 1 John. The whole, all five chapters. Read it. Do you know that you're saved, that you're born again. You think about this. Uh, next week, hopefully, uh, I'm going to do, you know, everybody does this. I'm going to do one of these things where we go back over the year and look at some of the news stories we talked about. I, I think I want to do that next week. I'm not sure yet. Uh, maybe to see just how far closer to the Lord's coming we've come. But I want to say this to you. We started this, I believe, back in January, January 14th of this year. And uh, I have had probably more fun and more, uh, I've experienced greater things in the ministry this year than I ever have in my life. And I thank the Lord Jesus Christ, number one. You know, we started out with nothing. We st still don't have a whole lot, and it doesn't matter. Because one of the things that, that I knew doing this program was about was offering it free to people. And that way, people couldn't threaten to pull money from your ministry so you could change what you're saying. I've tried to as best as I can to try to stick with what this Bible says. Some people liked it. Some people didn't. I can't help that. All I can do is tell you what I think this Bible is saying. But I appreciate all of you who write letters, emails, phone calls, write letters of encouragement, send in a donation or two. I appreciate that. I want you to know that I love you. And I'm not just saying that. that. I mean, if you get to know me, you know that this is the real me right here. I mean, I may be corrupt in a lot of ways. In fact, I know that I am. But one of the things that God has done for me is that I just really like to love people. And I want you to know I love you. Somebody called me the other day, and they said, Pastor, I mean, they was crying, Pastor Mike, I want you to pray about something for me. I was, I was deeply touched that they felt that they could call me. Somebody thousands of miles away. Somebody else writing me an email, Pastor Mike, such and such and such and such. Will you please pray? Will you have your church pray? Man, I tell you what, there's nothing greater in the world than for Christian people to reach out to one another and to say, can you help me? Will you pray for me? This year has been an excellent year for Mike Hoggart. It hasn't always been that way. Maybe at some point in the future, things may not, probably won't go so well for me. I at least know that there's some people out there that I can get in touch with and say, will you please, will you please pray for me? And uh, it's been a joy. I, it kind of sounds like, you know, I'm, this is the last episode. No, we're going to keep doing this for as long as the Lord wants. Uh, we're going to have a new look next year. I'm excited about that, uh, but it'll still be the same message. And appreciate all of our watchers. Appreciate all of you people. I love you very much. I believe that I can say this, in spite of all the pagan practices that are associated with it and everything like that, I love Christmas. I love celebrating the coming of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It means a lot to me. You know, I might do a study on that. I, I mean, there's a lot of things that I know. But it's okay to get together at least one time a year. It doesn't matter what day it is or what day it isn't. And celebrate the fact that Jesus came 
to live the life that you and I live so that he as the high priest could have compassion upon his people. I'd say that that's worth celebrating. I hope that you, your family, and everybody that you are in contact with have a very merry and holy Christmas day. At the Hoggard House, I'm not much on ritual, but we try to every year sit down before we do anything else. Read the Bible and pray as a family and tell God thank you. Maybe you ought to try that where you're meeting this Friday. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you at the next Watchman Pure Bible Study. Bye-bye.